Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy, where we help prepare you for a bright future in the space industry. SpaceX is doing amazing things right now. The Dragon Capsule is America's only way to get humans into space at this time, and the Super Heavy Lift Starship should be flying soon. But long before Elon Musk was even born, Lockheed was creating amazing machines for flight. The Lockheed Aircraft Company was founded by Alan Lockheed in 1926. This was just 23 years after the Wright brothers invented the first functional airplane. It was based in Hollywood, California, and later moved to Burbank. It first developed the Vega model airplane. This airplane set many records, being flown by famous pilots like Amelia Earhart. In just two years, the company had sales exceeding $1 million, a fortune back then, and still quite a bit now. Then the Great Depression hit, and everything crashed. Lockheed went into receivership, but was able to survive, eventually being bought for just $40,000 in 1932. Prior to World War II, Lockheed made the Model 14 airplane, which later became the basis for the Hudson Bomber. Interestingly, they also made the Model 14 Super Electra, which was sold overseas, including to Japan. Japan bought 100 of them for its military. Then World War II started. During this war, Lockheed made innovative aircraft like the P-38 Lightning and formed an advanced development projects branch, sometimes called Skunk Works. This was a term often used in business and engineering, to describe an organization given a high degree of autonomy. The term came from a moonshine factory in the comic strip Lil Abner. The Advanced Development Projects Group continued innovating after the war, creating, among other things, this amazing aircraft. This is the Lockheed XFV, built for the U.S. military in 1953. Here you can see two counter-rotating propellers. This plane could climb at 55 meters per second with a cruise speed of 660 kilometers per hour. This airplane actually flew and was later modified for horizontal landing also. But it was a little too slow for combat. This type of innovation convinced everyone that Lockheed was an amazing engineering company. Then Lockheed immortalized its name in the history of aviation by building this. This is the A-12 a variant of which became the slightly slower SR-71. Both had been developed from a reconnaissance aircraft project in the 1960s. The A-12 first flew in 1964 and wasn't retired until 1999. For 35 years, this was the fastest aircraft on Earth, reaching a velocity of up to Mach 3.5 and probably exceeding it. The MiG-25 could cruise at Mach 2.83, but to reach Mach 3.2, it would have to overspeed and damage its engines. In 1977, Lockheed was reformed as the Lockheed Aircraft Corporation. Then in 1995, Lockheed merged with the Martin Marietta Corporation. Martin Marietta had built lots of airplanes, but also Vikings 1 and 2 in the early 1970s, which got pictures of Phobos and Deimos on their way to landing on Mars where they took these beautiful pictures, showing the red sky and blue sunset, as well as Martian snow on sand dunes. And Marietta built the Magellan spacecraft in 1989, which traveled to Venus, using advanced radar processing by these electronics to map the surface of the planet. Prior to their merger in 1995, these two companies had achieved great success in the space industry and Lockheed Marietta was chosen as the prime contractor for the Constellation program. Constellation had wanted to return Americans to the moon by no later than 2020. I know, it makes me sad too, with a crude flight to Mars as the ultimate goal. But coming back from the moon or Mars is not easy. Re-entering from orbit requires that you hit the atmosphere with a velocity of about 7.8 kilometers per second. Returning from the moon requires you to hit the atmosphere at about 11 kilometers per second. 
the space shuttle could not survive a lunar return. Neither could the Dragon capsule without modification. Lockheed started working on this problem, and this is the Orion capsule, called the Crew Exploration Vehicle. This ship is composed of a launch abort system, the Orion crew module itself with its heat shield, the service module, and an adapter to let it fit on the launch vehicle. The Constellation program was later canceled, but the Orion survived, and it was redesigned for the Journey to Mars initiative. With the service module being replaced by the European Space Agency's automated transfer vehicle. These components were built and tested. The parachutes worked, the water landings went fine, and in 2014 it was launched into space. Unlike the Starliner built by Boeing, Exploration Flight Test 1 went perfectly. This test was launched on the 5th of December 2014 from Cape Canaveral on a Delta IV Heavy. This is the three-core hydrogen-powered heavy lift rocket made by ULA. The ship was in orbit for two orbits, which took four hours, reaching a high apogee on the second orbit, so it could come down for a high-energy re-entry, hitting the atmosphere at 8.9 kilometers per second. The advanced heat shield worked fine, as did everything else. The Orion Serial No. 1 made a safe water landing and is now on display at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Orion Vehicles Serial Numbers 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 have been or are being completed. But what has happened since 2014? The answer is nothing. Orion is dependent on the SLS to fly, and with the SLS continually running late and over budget, this beautiful spacecraft is grounded. Or is it? The Orion spacecraft is 3.3 meters long or 10 feet 10 inches long and has a diameter of 5.03 meters or 16 feet 6 inches. It has a mass of 10,400 kilograms. The European service module is 4 meters or 13 feet long. It has a diameter of 4.1 meters and a gross mass of 13,500 kilograms, with 8,600 kilograms of that being propellant. It has one AJ-10 hypergolic rocket engine that can produce 26.6 kilonewtons of thrust, mixing aerosene 50, a 50-50 mixture of hydrazine and unsymmetric dimethylhydrazine, with MON3, which stands for Mixed Oxides of Nitrogen. The AJ-10 can produce a specific impulse of 319 seconds in vacuum. Here's what it looks like on an SLS Block 1. And here's what it would look like in a Starship. While the SLS is still grounded, the Starship is scheduled to fly a transorbital mission in just one month. If the Starship survives to re-entry during that test flight, it will be farther along in just three years than SLS is after a decade of development. Starship on its second flight could easily carry the Orion system to orbit. You will notice I didn't mention the mass of the crew for this mission. That is because Starship will not be safe to carry crew at this point but with several Orion capsules ready to go, we can take the risk and get it to orbit. The Starship would release the Orion, then a Dragon capsule would launch with the crew, docking with the Orion and transferring over, then returning on its own. The Orion, with its European transfer vehicle, has enough Delta V to put itself on a lunar orbit mission, similar to Apollo 8, where the ship was launched from low Earth orbit into a return trajectory without any further major orbital changes necessary. It was pulled around the moon by gravity and thrown back toward the Earth. This would give the crew of the Orion spacecraft an opportunity to test its systems on a deep space mission. If this all seems too risky for NASA, the ship could be sent uncrewed, using autonomous programming to control the ship on its flight around the moon and testing the heat shield at lunar return velocity. There is no reason why Orion should have to wait for the SLS, but another excellent option is waiting at Starbase. Something to think about. Thanks for listening. Please don't forget to help support us on Patreon, and stay safe at Astroproterra.